Uh, I'm a point amongst a variety of academics here at the University of Manchester, uh, who will be talking to you about exciting science uh, all of today as well as tomorrow. So let's uh, begin the talk. Uh, I'll briefly talk about myself. All the words you see on this slide here describe my work uh, and the, it describes the best of what I do on a normal day. Uh, some of the terms on this slide may be familiar to some of you. Uh, I'll go through them so that we are familiar with these terms because I'll be using them a lot. So my key research areas include use of analytical methods uh, to study different biomarkers. Uh, so metabolomics is studying small molecules within our bodies. And what do I mean by biomarkers? Well, these molecules are chemicals at the end of the day, and they are within our bodies that indicate either if we are in a good health or bad health. I further use something called what we know as chemometrics to achieve this. Uh, chemometrics is use of different statistical methods and approaches to understand the behavior of these chemicals in our bodies or in, uh, in a system. So my recent work has been focusing on Parkinson's disease as well as tuberculosis. But what's made me really excited recently is sebomics. So what I mean by sebomics is study of sebum. Now sebum is an oily secretion. Most of us probably know it uh, from our teenage years. Uh, you can associate it with uh, acne. So if you have acne, you probably have uh, come across sebum. That's the oily liquid on your skin. Uh, it is a biofluid that is not really well studied though, uh, but has excellent diagnostic potential. And today I want to show you some of that data. So to briefly tell you about myself, uh, I was never a chemist to start with and definitely not an analytical chemist when I was at uni. Uh, I studied biomedical sciences at the university, um, but in one of the lectures, uh, one of my tutors said, biomarkers are also chemicals. And this simple sentence really struck me and that changed for me. I wanted to find ways in which we can start discovering biomarkers and actually doing it faster in a more reproducible way. So in about 2012, uh, I completed my PhD uh, using multi -traptof. It's an instrument, it's a hybrid mass spectrometer. Uh, and using that instrument gave me idea of analytical techniques and first and use of it. Uh, the idea for my PhD was to discover biomarkers for Down syndrome, uh, but not just by studying person with Down syndrome, it was to study maternal urine. So uh, my approach was to monitor different stages of pregnancy and study maternal urine in different weeks of gestation, and then investigate if change in fetal genome was also reflected in urinary metabolome. So when I say urinary metabolome, small molecules that we find in urine, do they actually reflect how the genotype or how genes in a fetus changes? So this whole PhD project hooked me into analytical sciences, and I joined Professor Goodacre at the University of Manchester in 2014. Uh, and that's when I started uh, actually probing mass spec data uh, using different statistical and chemometrics approaches to understand these molecules. Then in 2017, I came across a really interesting project that Professor Barron, who is also on this call, uh, was about to embark on. And it was about smell of Parkinson's disease. So I joined her efforts in using metabolomics and chemometrics uh, to decode the smell of Parkinson's. And this year I've decided to translate all that knowledge that I've accumulated about sebum as well as smell that is associated with diseases. So I'm working towards eradicating tuberculosis and hopefully I want to translate all this knowledge to a greater contribution to personalized medicine, hopefully somewhere down the line. So in a nutshell, what do I do? So a typical life cycle of my research is measuring small molecules uh, using various analytical techniques, so mass spectrometer, spectroscopy, NMR, uh, and then using machine learning algorithms to mine these huge data sets. So to, when I say mine, is to find needle in a haystack. I, I, I'm trying to do is use these clever statistical approaches to predict biomarkers within this small, these, these different biofluids that can indicate the presence of a disease or even indicate if we are in a healthy state. But what I'm aiming now is to transfer both of these different approaches, uh, biomarkers and smart algorithms onto variables like smart watches and something that can be put on your skin. So it could be even something simple as a nicotine patch uh, and try and monitor health or disease. What will that do? It will probably promote more healthy living. Uh, I'll talk about how this can all work together in, in my next few slides. 
So now you'll probably want to ask, but how does that all fit into personalized medicine? You mentioned personalized medicine. So what do we mean by personalized medicine? We mean not having paracetamol prescribed to all of us if we have got some kind of ache. Uh, everyone has a different threshold to medicine, a different way our body reacts. And if we personalize this dosages of medicine on how good we take this medicine, how our body reacts, uh, we probably have a much better response from our body. So in this picture here, what you see is my rain cycle for biomarkers. So on the left-hand side of picture where you see lots of trees, these are different academic research groups like mine, my, like Perdita's and others in, the, in, you know, in different universities, and they generate lots of data on biomarkers. Uh, imagine it as a river of biomarkers, but not all of them are really good biomarkers. Only some of them are retained with good enough funding. So you can see at the bottom where the water sinks into the earth, and if it's good enough funding, they become a nice, really fruitful tree on which a nice cartoon is leaning. So this fruitful tree is good biomarkers of diseases that have come out of good science. So on the right hand side, you see the end user with his smartphone, his smartwatch and his smart glasses. Right now, what the user is doing is using that to count his steps, uh, maybe count his calories and heartbeat. But what if we can use all the biomarker data, put it into a cloud facility, where machine learning can use that data along with the data that the sensors on the end user are also detecting. So all your heartbeat counts, your calorie data, your step counts, what if we combine them with what the analytical techniques are measuring? So let me give an example. If a diabetic person monitors his blood glucose, he generally keeps an eye on his daily activity as well, because you need exercise to you know, use that glucose up. Uh, they probably do it via the smartwatch. But what if there was a sensor on the smartwatch that could monitoring changes on his skin 24 seven and say if he had a muffin today and his blood glucose was extra high, the smartwatch could, watch could detect this and prompt him to do more activity today than his usual activity. That will burn off the extra sugar. So that's where I see the analytical chemistry's role in personalized medicine. Uh, on the right here, what you see is a list of different metabolomics researches that has occurred in last 10 to 15 years. These are about 68 different studies that I've listed in here. And they've said that there are 240 biomarkers for different diseases. But the crux is not a single one of them have made into a successful test. So I talk about this in more detail in the review that you see right at the bottom of this slide, uh, if you're interested. But the point I want to make from this slide is there could be lots of research in this field, but without using participant reported data, and without trying to use clever machine learning to combine all of it, we may end up with biomarkers that are not really useful, but if you combine them, we could make them more useful. So you might have heard me saying the word chemometrics a few times, but what is actually chemometrics? I want to explain this in a very simple example. So let's assume our faces are a chemical, and all the features on our face are different properties of chemical, like how volatile the chemical is, uh, how many saturated uh, carbon bonds it has, etc. So eye could be one thing, nose could be the other. If I showed you one eye here, it's a feature of the face, a feature or a property of a chemical. Can anyone in this whole Zoom call tell us whose face this is? Probably not. You could guess, but maybe not right. If I gave you another example of this chemical, uh, another feature, hair, maybe some of you might guess it, some of you might not. If I gave you a third feature, you could be close to guessing this chemical, but you could still be wrong because two chemicals could actually look really alike. And if they look really alike, it's really hard to separate them without the use of analytical techniques. So when the two chemicals are so similar, it's hard to tell them apart. This is where the chem combination of analytical chemistry and smart chemometrics is extremely powerful to distinguish these chemicals. And it's really helpful because then you want to know what is the real biomarker. So now that you understand the idea of chemometrics uh, for the discovery of biomarkers, the question probably in your head is, so what? You can do this, but how do you actually use it? What's the real life application of combining analytical techniques and chemometric approaches? Well, for a good metabolomic study, a study which studies small molecules, you account for something called confounders because we are all different. We are of different ages. We have different BMI. We eat different things. We have different levels of exercise. All these things changes the confound, all these things changes how the metabolites are expressed in us. So a good metabolomic study has good design of experiment that really accounts for these factors. Uh, the sample sizes are quite huge. 
So you're talking about hundreds to thousands of people in one experiment. And then you extract all the possible metabolites with really good extraction procedures. So you're, you're talking about five to 10,000 good number of metabolites that you would have extracted. And then you would be using lots of analytical techniques because not a single analytical technique will be able to tell you everything about an eye, a nose or hair, three different features. Uh, maybe an analytical technique tells you about two of the features, but for to know the third feature, you might have to use a different technique. So when you do all that, you end up with a large, large, huge metabolome data. And when you do that, this data set itself it could be in terabytes. So how do you question or in interrogate this huge amount of data? And this is where the machine learning approaches come in. This is where you build motors using the data you generate. And then to find the needle in the haystack, you build smart algorithms that can then test that unknown data. So then if you were someone wants to do 1,000 new data sets, uh, you can use this current model to test if your biomarker is actually present in a different data set. So using that approach, uh, in collaboration with Professor Baran and a group, I've looked at approximately 800 participants so far uh, using gas chromatography mass spectrometry, uh, which you can see on the top left corner for volatile analysis. And I've also used liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. Uh, so to just summarize these techniques for those unfamiliar, uh, both the chromatography techniques are similar to paper chromatography that you might be familiar with your A-levels or previous school. Uh, it separates things based on its affinity and how they move across a stationary phase. So things that have got good affinity to the stationary phase will bind to it and will separate out later, which you can see on this animation there. So different peaks come out differently when they separate to that big GCMS coil. Uh, the idea to do this is because the mixture of chemicals need to be looked at one after the other. You can't look, of, look at all of them if they all come out and hit your detector at the same time, which is your mass spectrometer. Now, mass spectrometer weighs the mass of these chemicals. So every chemical would have a different mass. Uh, some of them would have similar masses, but you can weigh them to really good accuracy. So what you see on the top right picture is Joy, uh, the lady who can smell Parkinson's. So as he, so what we do with Parkinson's is we take a soap from the back of the participants uh, we heat it up, uh, which is the thermal desorption part, the yellow bit uh, in the cartoon. Uh, and when you heat it up, the analytes, which are volatile, things that can go into vapor form and the gas form, uh, will go off from the surface of the swab and go into air. And then it separates on chromatography. While this is happening, Joy will be set there with a mouthpiece on her nose, and she can smell these chemicals as they separate. And before they hit the mass pack, they can also go to Joy's nose. So these are, these are the two things happening simultaneously. Joy is smelling it, and with a clicker in her hand, she can tell us how intense the smell is and for how long it lasts. So if a peak comes for about three seconds, a chemical stays on the column for three seconds, Joy can tell us if all three seconds are smelly. Uh, and her, on her headset, she can describe this, so she can say this smells like vanilla, this smells like coffee, this smells like burnt toast. And all, and all of this happens in real time. So what we have found is by doing this, uh, we can find smelly markers or odorous compounds uh, that are used to, uh, that can be used to detect Parkinson's. But what it can also do is it can detect Parkinson's and differentiate it from controls with about 75% accuracy. So out of 175 times, we can correctly say if someone has got Parkinson's. Of course, that doesn't stop us because we want to make it better. So what we have also done is we have used liquid chromatography, which uses a sample in liquid form rather than gas uh, to find things that don't really smell uh, but could be still lipid-like on the sebum. Uh, and then using the chemometrics or statistical approaches I mentioned, uh, we were able to find four peculiar pathways or four peculiar ways in which the body has changed with Parkinson's. So you can see it on the bottom right figure with those different dots. So the bigger the dot, the pathway is changed more. Uh, the smaller the dot, it isn't. And as the disease progresses, we can monitor uh, how certain chemicals or these biomarkers change in the disease. Why is this research so important? It is important because the current diagnosis is only done when about 60 to 70 percent neuronal damage in brain has already occurred in Parkinson. So we probably know Parkinson as a disease where people have tremors, but there are other signs and symptoms. But these symptoms develop as the damage occurs in your brain. So by the time it's 70% damage, that's when we can clinically diagnose people at the moment. Uh, so the pink line you see in the bottom right is where you can detect Parkinson's at the current stage. But what we are now trying to do is push that line from stage two, three to four 
to stage one or two or earlier. So by doing this, you can detect someone as Parkinson's before they have got too much neuronal damage. So to summarize, uh, my particular research of Parkinson's, Joy planted this little seed by a very simple question that she asked T. Lokunath, uh, who was our clinical lead. Uh, and by following up on Joy's question, we use gas chromatography to decode the smell of Parkinson's. But instead of stopping after knowing what makes it smell, what we did was we used multiple analytical approaches. So we used things like liquid chromatography, we used paper spray, we're also doing uh, native protein analysis in Bodita's lab. And these are different approaches by which we are trying to understand Parkinson's sebum. So let me talk a little bit about the paper chromatography. It is a very simple technique, but a very powerful technique as well. You literally have a tiny triangle of paper uh, and it will have sebum that is rubbed on the back. And that paper, you can imagine as an envelope that can be posted by Royal Mail. Uh, it could travel in Royal Mail over a day at first class post, it could reach the lab. And within three minutes, on a mass spec at ambient temperature, so uh, without storing it in fridge freezers, you can generate a signature of molecules or chemicals in sebum that can tell us with almost 80% accuracy if someone has got Parkinson's. But that brings us to a bigger tree question now. Can sebum be a good biofluid to monitor other diseases? And the answer is yes. So it didn't come to me as a surprise at all when Joel told us that she can smell tuberculosis amongst other diseases. It was a great pointer at this point, and I had definitely no skepticism that she can smell disease or disease can smell, because by this point, I was very convinced this is to smell. So we did a pilot study with Joy, uh, with our collaborators in Tanzania. So Apopo is a non-profit organization. Uh, they train giant pouch rats uh, to smell TNT, landmines in Africa. At this point now, there are no landmines in Africa, so obviously they had to reprogram these rats to keep them useful. So now they've trained them to smell tuberculosis. And this is what we did. Uh, we got Joy into a clinic in Tanzania, and as soon as she walked into a clinic, she straight away said, this smells very strong yeast-like smell. You know, like when you have fresh dough of bread, something like that. And it was interesting observation because everyone in that waiting area had tuberculosis or had symptoms of tuberculosis. And then we gave her sputum from tuberculosis without tuberculosis to see what kind of smell she associates with it. So we gave her a negative uh, sample, which had no tuberculosis, and uh, she said it just smells like breath. And then we gave her a low load of tuberculosis sample, so a very small amount of bacteria in it, and she said it's very salty. The more tuberculosis increases, the smell change. So in stage one and two of tuberculosis, when the load is medium-ish of the bacteria, she said it smells like brine saline solution. And when it was really bad TB, stage three, she said it smelled like a leg ulcer, so like pusk kind of smell, it was a very bad smell. So obviously she knew what these samples were. So now it was time to test her with blinded trials where she didn't know. So the tubes didn't have a label, we just gave her the tubes and said, can you put them as different stages of TB? And surprisingly, she was able to do it really well with negatives. So people didn't have TB, she was definitely able to say that person doesn't have TB. And she was also able to say if someone had really bad TB, uh, which is the two extreme ends of tuberculosis. When it came to different grades of tuberculosis, she had some error in it. So to put it in other words, Joy was able to tell us if someone didn't have TB at all, which you can see with four true negative predicted negative. So true negative is they definitely didn't have TB. We knew about it, Joy didn't. And she predicted that they didn't have TB. So four out of four. But she also did this with someone with extreme case of TB. Uh, she couldn't do it as well, but she did it quite well. Uh, with the TB1 and 2 cases, grade 1 and 2. Now, this is better than trained rats. Why? Because the rats cannot do four different stages of TB, so they can't do low TB, 1, 2, and 3 grade of TB. They can only do three stages of TB. So Joy was better than trained rats uh, from Tanzania. And this was great news, because now we knew that Joy can smell tuberculosis really well. So what I've done now is I've set up a study with Apopo, uh, the same uh, non-profit organization, and I'm hoping to develop this methodology to find sebum-based biomarkers in tuberculosis. Uh, they, train mice, uh, they train rats, and uh, obviously the rats smell humans. Now the world wants to end tuberculosis by 2035. This is the goal everyone, every nation in the country is going towards. But there is a small problem. Currently, we can only detect TB by bacterial culture. Apopo is doing something with sputum. The sputum is what you, you know, when you spit. Uh, now, 
this is the problem that a proposed method won't work. Why? Because babies, if they get infected, they'll keep spreading tuberculosis and it, it will never end. We can't easily test babies uh, because they can't produce sputum. Uh, infants can't produce sputum. So after you test them earlier, you have to wait to do the bacterial culture and it takes too long and by that time more people are infected. So being able to take a sample from skin and detect it in a very non-invasive way is great to test babies. So I'm going to use the knowledge of smell of TB and develop a test first in adults to classify different stages of TB by just taking a simple swab from the back, hopefully from, from a piece of paper, uh, and be able to detect tuberculosis if someone has got it right at the early stages. And this is an ongoing project. So if we do that, we combine joy uh, with samples from children somewhere in down the future using different techniques. The whole slide I showed you about different steps of metabolomic study, we should be able to detect tuberculosis much early. But I don't want to stop there. What I want to do is I want to take even further with some of the collaborators in the university and, and transfer the smart machine learning or smart maths onto a wearable sensor so that we can monitor sebum biomarkers in real time without visiting labs or using mass spec. And this is the idea which is already being done somewhere in the world where people can use smart machine learning algorithm on a chip and clinicians can look at a size, shape and edges of a mole and then classify that mole into being just a normal mole or a melanoma that will spread and become cancerous. So the idea is there, all we need is biomarkers on sebum to then translate into a wearable patch and we can just put that patch on people to see if the tuberculosis infection is actually there, if it's spreading. And obviously these days, we can't have a talk without having a talk about COVID-19. So along with Professor Barrett and several others at the university and other partner universities in the UK, we have recently got a grant from UKRI to develop a serum-based test. And this test is to develop uh, early diagnosis and detection of COVID-19. But what's more interesting is as a part of bigger coalition of about 500 scientists, uh, Professor Barra and I are also collaborating with some of these scientists to develop a sebum based test. So you don't even need to take serum or blood from someone. You could again sw swap someone from the back and based on this markers on sebum, you can diagnose if someone has got COVID-19. So towards the end of my talk, I would really like to thank my collaborators, uh, Professor Barra and Monte Silva de Rentilo Kuna, uh, and the funders Michael J. Fox Foundation and Parkinson's to support our Parkinson study. I would like to thank Apopo, MRC, and again Perdita for our study of tuberculosis, uh, and Melanie Bailey from Surrey University and UKRI and Perdita uh, again uh, for the study we are about to start on detecting biomarkers in sebum for COVID-19. This is my last slide. So before I finish, I want you to take one key message out of all this is no matter what your future academic career is, uh, if you start research in science, definitely collaborate. And especially after COVID-19, I would say definitely collaborate, no matter of what area of research you take home. Uh, because good science comes from working on your own, definitely. But excellent science will only be born when you collaborate with others. And with that slide, I would like to thank you all for still being here, those who are still here towards the last slide. And I'll finish my presentation here and happy to take questions with Professor Barron. I'll stop the screen share at this point. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, someone has asked, uh, hi, how do you efficiently analyze biofluids like sebum samples uh, taken from humans for biomarkers when they are contaminated with microorganisms found on skin? Does this presence disrupt analysis when it comes to digital, digital testers? So yes and no. So it's, it's a good question, uh, definitely, because what you're talking about here is exposome, things we are exposed to, and skin being something we're exposed to all the time. So it's not just the bacteria we're talking about, it's also what we get from the environment uh, that affects it. But like Perdita mentioned in the answer, uh, using chemometrics approaches, what you can do is you can test people with different genotypes, with different diets, with different regional um, background, and you can tell if the biomarker you are detecting changes 
if someone comes from a different country, for example. And that's what we have done with Parkinson's. So we have other collaborating centers uh, in Europe. And what we wanted to see is, obviously in Europe, different countries have different diet. So for example, one of the groups uh, comes from a country where you will have lots of cheese and dairy in your diet. So if you're lots of cheese and dairy in your diet, does that affect the biomarker uh, that you would say is predicting Parkinson's? And we compared them with what we found. And what we found was this biomarker doesn't change no matter what diet you have or what country you come from it can still detect Parkinson's as effectively, which means that biomarker is independent of everything else. You can do similar things with bacteria as well. So if you suspect a biomarker comes from a certain bacteria that goes, grows on skin, you could test people with and without. So you do a bacterial culture and see, uh, find people who have same bacteria and people who don't, and see if the biomarker you claim is a biomarker does change by this bacterial makeup on skin. If it doesn't, then your informatics will tell you that it's the same biomarker and still can distinguish between disease and control. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question uh, was, hi, do you predict that smart wearable technology will become an important part of the future, decreasing the possibility uh, for an unnecessary need for GP services? Uh, will they become a more reliable self-diagnosis system? Uh, good question. And I think we can never be independent of GPs or good medical advice, and we shouldn't. Uh, but so I'll answer it in two parts. First, about smart wearable technologies. Yes, it will become mainstream, and it will become better at detecting things. For example, Apple Watch 5 will be able to now detect oxygen in your blood. Apple Watch 4 was able to detect your uh, heartbeats or your fibrillations. So with every new iteration of smart technology, things will improve in what it can detect, but that doesn't mean that the results are independent of medical advice. Uh, say Apple Watch 6 starts measuring your blood pressure and you get high blood pressure consistently. That doesn't mean you're, you've got high blood pressure. It could be because you're taking too much coffee in your day-to-day -day routine, which could be my case, and I should cut down on coffee and my blood pressure will go down back to normal. So for that kind of scenario, I need to, before I start taking blood pressure medication, see a GP and get the advice. And he might tell me, based on my diet, I don't need medication. All I need is stop drinking five cups of espresso a day and it will go back to normal. So we still need GPs for this advice. So on the, um, I mean, I think just it's worth pointing out and Drew Pad did in, in his presentation, he, he talked about the clinicians that we collaborate with a lot of what we're doing is trying to combine the clinical phenotype in terms of what a clinician will observe based on the way the patient is and the patient can self-diagnose that with a molecular phenotype, which is what we will measure in terms of how their, um, their, their, the molecules that we can detect in this case on skin and, and other observables, how that, how, that, how that contributes to that person. But all of it is, is working towards a more individualized or stratified view of, of health. Um, so it won't replace, but it should provide better detail. Uh, one of the things that we found really interesting about sebum is it seems to have a very good preservative quality. So we have, um, as, as was mentioned in the talk, the, the, the samples come to us through the post. We don't have to put them on ice or anything like that. And we have measured samples that have come and we've sat them on the shelf for some time. Um, and they seem to give us good signals of those that have just been taken. Um, that's really interesting for us. Joy also is able to smell t-shirts that were worn by people with Parkinson's years ago, and she can still distinguish whether the person has Parkinson's or not. So that's really interesting from a kind of um, usage point of view, but also from the point of view of odour, because we think of volatile things as things that kind of go away, but it seems like sebum acts as a really good reservoir for, for these volatile components. If you want to answer the next one, um, there's lots of questions now, hang on, we should go back up. Um, blah, 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 blah. So populations across the world, you can answer that one. Yes, so the biomarkers do differ from populations across the world if they are coming or if they are a result of one of the common things that you eat or drink. Uh, but if it's a biomarker like uh, something that's affected by your hormones, for example, it may not be because of different part of the world. But yes, basically it, it differs from people to people or from 
a race or a, from a particular region because it would be dependent on it. But a good biomarker should be the marker that doesn't get affected by food. It shouldn't be affected by different population or race. And certainly what we found with the Parkinson's is that we can't tell where the sample came from, but within, you know, whether it came from other European countries, UK, and so on. So we distinguish, we look particularly for those biomarkers that distinguish that uh, kind of disease based rather than um, individual based. So that's one of the reasons the, the scrolling slide I showed of about 68 research is that these are all biomarkers in individual research, but if a country somewhere else where the research wasn't conducted does the same thing, they don't find the biomarker, and that's the reason they are not in clinics. So biomarkers, yes, you can find them, but good biomarkers that go in clinics should be independent of these things. So the question about the mutating diseases such as flu strains, um, I, I guess, um, the, it's sort of answered in, 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 in what we said. We look to stratify. Sampling is really important and how sampling is done and what additional metadata we know about the person when it's done is really critical. So for the work we're about to commence on COVID, we've used a really strict set of protocols where people are sampled in hospital when they first arrive and then uh, 48 hours afterwards and then eight days afterwards and then we hope 30 days after that so that is the, the point at which they come to hospital usually with coronavirus is a point at which the cytokine storm in, in the respiratory system of the person has got really really strong and they're finding it very difficult to exist outside it, it, it may be different stages of infection but for most people it's around about 10 to 12 days so, so in this sense we are careful in general about when we sample and that way we can get some longitudinal profile of, of the biomarkers. With respect to how the disease is made and that may affect people, that's where we need to work closely with genomic information with respect to the actual you know, the, 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 the actual virus and, and how that is different. And so that's um something we are doing and, and do do so it's combining the information you get from the genomic study of the flu or, or coronavirus um material versus how that is affected the individual so why do we what do we only use sebum as a biomarker what's special about it all right so this is so what's special about sebum from our perspective is it's just really underexplored um, so that's interesting as a scientist. That's really interesting to find something that everyone has but no one's thought about before, except, of course, for uh, acne and other skin diseases. There it's thought about. But where it's particularly useful is, as I've indicated, is the preservative quality and the fact that we don't have to store it as you would do with urine um, under very cold conditions. So there is a real advantage. Now, of course, Obtaining a urine sample is relatively easy, but it's not as easy as obtaining a sebum sample, which is extremely easy. Um, and so the transfer of the material, the storage of the material, um, and as I said, the sort of preservative nature of the medium seems to put people into a really um, good category. Uh, do you want to answer the joy smell question? Uh, is it just joy who can smell diseases? Probably not. Uh, so since uh, we published our first work and also it was out in news that joy could smell diseases, Perdita probably gets five emails a day from someone saying mm -hmm. they can smell as well. Uh, so no, there are more people who think they can smell as well and who probably can smell. Uh, and we have a list of people who have approached and we think at some point we'll have more smellers, not just joy, uh, to verify the smell. But the problem with this is smell is very individual or very subjective. So what Joy smells as vanilla, probably you smell as strawberry. And what Joy smells as coffee, you probably smell as hazelnut. So it's very descriptive on how different smellers will smell the same thing. And it just adds to the confusion if we start adding more smellers. But we are working on a standardized way in which we can scale the smell of different people. And then we can use more people who can smell diseases. Just more. Uh 
it, it, to add to that um, very good answer, the, the, reason, the, 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 the profound question is why does disease smell? And the answer to that is because we need to know who to not feed anymore. And it's a very fundamental and, and quite gruesome point about what happens to individuals when they are affected by, by an illness which is going to be terminal. And, and it's very little discussed, but, but everyone who has had someone who is in their family or close to them who is, who is dying, they have a smell. Um, and everyone, know, or not, or people comment on that, but they don't tend to discuss it. And so I think there is an interesting statement about how we have downplayed smell as a observable um, in, in medicine, and we've downplayed it because we constantly wash and deodorize and um, all of these things, and perhaps that's what our bodies are, you know, the warnings they're giving out. Um, and we've got a question about false positive on COVID. Okay. It's a really good question. So how do you ensure that someone does not get a false positive from COVID-19 patch sebum test if the immunity to virus, if they're immune to virus but are carrying on skin because they're in contact with someone else? Uh, would it not be false positive? Yes, if you're measuring COVID-19 on skin, it would be. But what we are trying to measure, the biomarker is the effect of COVID-19. So if you have COVID-19 in you, in your lungs, your body is going to start reacting. So your metabolome or your set of small molecules that your body produces normally would be very different. And what our biomarker will be, would be something that's produced as a result of a really high amount of COVID in your lungs. And we wouldn't be measuring COVID. So if someone was in contact with someone with COVID on like hand-to-hand -hand contact or they shook hands, we wouldn't be measuring the virus itself, but the effect that is produced from inside the body that can be produced just by, you know, coming in contact with someone, they would have COVID. So the signature of someone with an active infection versus someone who already is immune to COVID would be very different. And that's what we want to measure as biomarker. So question on diabetes from Oscar. Um, that's a great question. And, and indeed, yes, but, but, but diabetes does have um, an odour. And in fact, it is a, it is, there's a test that paramedics are taught when they find someone who has, who has collapsed, and that is to smell their breath, because there's a very distinctive odour if someone is diabetic. There's also a distinctive odour if someone is, is drunk. Um, and both of those are important observables if, if, if someone, uh, you know, for, for paramedics. So absolutely, we work, um, I don't think we've had but we work with a company that, that trains dogs, and indeed they're actually working on smelling COVID too, but, but they can smell Parkinson's. And one of their main roles, actually, these dogs, these trained dogs, is to smell when people are about to enter into a hypoglycemic um, state. And so that people have trained dogs who, who live with them, particularly for very young children and old people, who might not be able to recognize the warnings of, of going hypoglycemic. And so those are, so, so yeah, diabetes is um, yeah. Is, is, question for is there a way of training people to smell the disease like rats are able to? Uh, probably yes. Uh, you could train people to smell. Uh, and uh, there is something very interesting. Uh, so I mentioned scaling people and the idea is to use uh, a set of smells that are very standard. So you could train people to smell apple as an apple and everyone smells the same smell and describes it as an apple and you can do it with infinite number of smells but for an unknown smell it might be difficult so joy describes smell of parkinson's as heavy musky smell now that's description from joy we don't know if it's an apple smell but if you're an apple smell uh, you could say this is apple smell smell it and this is how you smell it uh, but this is what joy does to herself as well so before doing any work she smells and trains her own nose so she would train her nose with a known smell. Uh, so you could train people to smell something and label them however they can remember that smell, and then they can smell it. Uh, but to train people to smell the thing and remember it in the same way and name the same thing might be difficult with unknown smells. But definitely with known smells, it should be possible. I think the other, the other thing that's worth pointing out here is that even and Joy is very good at smelling things, but she gets saturated. So she can really only successfully smell about seven, five to seven 
patient samples in a day. More than that really pushes her and, 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 and she has quite a strong allergic response actually to doing too much in the day. So that first test we did with the t-shirt, she really, it really, her nose flares up, she gets very red in the face, her eyes water. Um, and in general, um, she spent some time at the perfume house, Jivavan, and they said she was just outstanding as a smeller. Her nose was, it's the professional term of a nose, her, her nose is extremely good. Uh, but, but to an extent, she's almost too sensitive. So I think uh, what we know is that whilst you can train people, and they are used particularly in food and drink in the perfume industry, they really are used for this. Their capacity for high throughput and their um, lack of um, you know, lack of reproducibility, but their capability for reproducibility will never be as good as a as an analytical assay um, mediated by uh, GCMS or LCMS, even or, or maybe a wearable biosensor. Do you want to answer the NMR question, Trupad? Oh, sorry, there's one before that. Sorry. Graham's is before that. So do you think training machine learning algorithms to point to physical science that doctors can relate to could help integrating this technology? Uh, absolutely. And this is something we are already doing with Parkinson's. Now, so we have developed this, uh, uh, it's a web app, but it will become a mobile app at some point. Um, but what this app does, it, it gives uh, the clinicians chance to input the physical observations that they see about the Parkinson's patient. So they can score them based on how mobile they are, how agile they are. Uh, how frail they are and based on these scores uh, we can use the data and train the machine learning algorithms to combine them uh, with the analytical measurements mm -hmm. and to give you an example uh, from our LCMS study the liquid chromatography study uh, our initial prediction was 80 percent Parkinson's we could do it with 80 percent accuracy but if if we had these markers uh, physical signs that clinicians measure uh, we can push it up to 90 to 95 percent accuracy straight away so they are really useful uh, but then again, you want to find markers that are very dependable. Uh, these are again be, uh, these are again subjective, so clinician score has to be very repeatable as well. A clinician to clinician observation changes at the moment, so that's one of the problems with Parkinson's as well. So if you go to a clinic, your first sign could be constipation and tremors, or just constipation, and they would give you constipation medicine, whereas the other GP might not give you constipation medicine, and they might you know refer you straight away. So again those physical symptoms are subjective uh, if you're young then if you go with constipation and shakes then the, you don't the parkinson's is not the first thing that comes to gp they will probably think of other th things that are happening to you so we need to again have standardized scale on which gps measure these physical symptoms and once we have that we can start combining them to analytical data and it will definitely improve the way machine learning can predict someone with parkinson's Um, so the NMR, we, we we have not done it. The NMR um, of of, from, of the biomarkers and CD. Um, we, we work closely with NMR um, specialists, and, and certainly um, it might be something too. But but increasingly, um, it's not so much the low concentration. It's that they're really large molecules and quite complicated molecules, and even. Um, based on the work we've been trying to do to get some standards that are likely, it's um, proving very difficult to completely chemically identify them. So the targeted mass spectrometry approach is to look for, for features, for, for, for analytical features, that's retention time, mass, um, drift time, and then fragmentation pattern that distinguish that molecule, but our opportunity to precisely say it absolutely this molecule is, is really quite problematic particularly because we believe that the odor and, and the distinguishing biomarkers are, are lipid like and lipids as you i'm sure remember have long hydrocarbon tails and often have um, some level of, of saturation so double bond character along the hydrocarbon tail but knowing where you have um, where you have a double bond in a, in a 16 plus um, CH tail is, is extremely hard to define. Um, and so there are, yeah, so there are challenges. Um, um, Next one is can sebum analysis predict how long the patient has been suffering from the specific disease? Uh, 
good question but hard answer because yes but it requires lots and lots of research so you could do that if you had enough data to study that disease over a longitudinal range so at the moment we are studying parkinson's when someone would have parkinson's for at least three to four years versus people who are just diagnosed with parkinson this week for example uh, but they're diagnosed this week doesn't mean they didn't have parkinson a year ago they probably did have some onset of parkinson but there were not enough symptoms. So if the studies are pushed forward and forward, like we want to do with Parkinson's, there would be a point where you start catching the disease right at the onset. And if you can start doing that, then you can start predicting using biomarker or the level of the biomarker. Uh, if it's just an onset or if it goes up like this, you know, this is probably four years of disease. So someone had this disease four years ago. If it goes even higher, you know, it was about six years ago. So you could do that, but you need to have enough research longitudinally to train your biomarker over a time period and test it as well. And the other thing I guess that's worth pointing out at that point is that is, is that the length of time that someone has a disease is a very um is a question to which it's very difficult to answer. Um, there's emerging evidence particularly with Parkinson's disease but, but many diseases that actually people have the disease a long time before they are diagnosed and how long before they're diagnosed is something in a sense we want to address. So we would really like to be able to find biomarkers much before the onset of, of clinical symptoms and, and with Parkinson's before the disease has started to affect the, the brain, um, because in that way we may make it beautiful. So the, I suppose in a way what we're trying to do is is, is diagnosed as early as possible prior to in a, in a, in a, in a space where we can um, start to uh, well, we hope, use new therapies to, to prevent the onset, to prevent further onset. How does the same disease smell differently for different people? Oh, I think that it does not smell necessarily differently for different people, and, and many, as Drupal said, many people have mailed us about um, their partners often it's been women who talk about their husband interestingly so women appear to notice more or maybe smell better um, but it's also been I had one email from a hairdresser who talked about one of her clients smelling differently and then years later being diagnosed with Parkinson's and when these people are um, described as smell, they're quite consistent about what they say about it. Um, so I don't think that they smell it differently. What they, what, it's more about how they codify the smell, so how they will describe that smell. So there is a, and that is based on the way we associate a smell with other things. Um, so that's, so Joy now has smelt Parkinson's from so many people she's very good at codifying it but if you're someone who's only had one person in your life who has smelled your Parkinson's then you will have a very different relationship with that odour and your codifying of it may be different so the emails relate that they say gosh when I read about this work it became clear that that was the smell my husband had right and so that's a so, that, so it's so this is the complex interplay between you know, our physical senses and our, and our interpretation of those. I, and to add to that, I think it's it's same like body said, unless you've smelled enough of Parkinson's like Joy has, you wouldn't know. So if I remember correctly, Joy used to think about her husband that it's just old people smell. And it was similar experience to me. So Joy gave me a few samples to smell myself and said, can you not smell this? Because it was really strong smell. And I couldn't. To me, it was just old people smell. So unless I smell lots of people with Parkinson's, I wouldn't know. And that's when it occurred to Joe as well. She went to, went to a meeting with people. The room was filled with people with Parkinson's. And then she straight away knew that it wasn't old people smell. It was the same smell as us. So I think it's also, you know, being able to smell the smell for that long. Is it possible for biomarkers and see them from multiple diseases to conflict with and mask each other? Gosh, so, okay, um, that's a really big question. Um, first of all, I think just on the odour front, we are not limiting, and actually the rest of the chemicals can't smell anyway, so 
um, <laughs> we're not limiting what we do to things that, that are open right um conflicting is a is a interesting question we we would expect um to be able to separate you know, different molecules and that's why we use analytical methods to do that but there may well be different chemical signatures chemical processes biochemical processes that go on when you have what's called a comorbidity so when you have two diseases together an awful lot of our people with, who we've studied um, who have parkinson's also because they're elderly have hypertension some number are um, overweight and are diabetic or pre-diabetic and so we're already working in that space um, and I don't think that they will mask each other but there may be a more uh, uh, you know again it goes back to what I was saying about stratifying the the, 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 the landscape of biomarkers that we would have for the individual your questions have been fantastic I have to say that everyone who's, who's asked questions is really these are we, we we don't get these questions from like you know ancient professors so it's really wonderful to have them from you know, great young people i was presuming you're all young i can't see you all but anyway, mostly young people uh, okay uh, thank you very much uh for the very informative talk and q a uh, is there anything you want to add on or uh, any way you see your research uh going in the future um well, there's lots of places we see our research going. Um, I guess um, I would encourage you all to smell the world around you, and I think you probably will, and think about it. Um, I think what we are really keen on doing is developing low-cost methods to diagnose more people. Um, and so that's something you should all, as young people starting out, think about Think about those things. and, and um, we have more ideas than we can <laughs> we have time to do them so hopefully we'll have given you some ideas and i suspect we'll come up with some of your own and take you on uh, okay uh thank you very much and i'll hand over to uh Dukula, uh for any closing statements uh from chemsoc and campus uh yeah Thank you. Okay, I am not on mute right now. Okay. So thank you everybody uh, for coming. Thank you very much uh, for Dr. Rupa Trevedi and Professor Perdita for the time. You came and speak uh, about your research and answer for, and for answering the questions as well. And I will be closing the room shortly. And I want to remind uh, that you can submit a piece of work summarizing this talk if you want to. If you want to receive that certificate, check out your uh, reminder emails. Uh, there will be a, a sign up link. And look out for more information and the recorded talks on the Chemsoc and past social media accounts. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.